This is part 7 of the demo for building a UML class model. I'm Michael Blaha. So this is our last part and let's look a little bit at some evolution of the model. So one of the purposes, one of the reasons for, for um, being very careful with modeling a problem is one, so that you can capture uh, capture the understanding of the problem that the domain that the business experts are conveying to you. Uh, capture it. It's your understanding. It's their understanding. You're all in the same room. You're looking at this model. You're reaching a common understanding. Like I said, I construct these models live in front of an audience, just like you're seeing here on the web. So that's one purpose, is to capture the common understanding uh, so all can see it, all can converge, all can agree. Another reason is to document it. Uh, another reason is this kind of a model serves as a uh, starting point for development. You drive it right through into uh, into the database structure, and you drive it right through into object-oriented programming uh, um, class stubs. So, uh, so another reason for being very careful with formulating this model is you want to think through things carefully. The whole idea of software engineering is to think up front and not have to fix problems once you're well into development. So we thought through this model carefully. This is a sound model. If it's a good model, it should lend itself to evolution. Uh, a model, this model is a representation of reality. It's a natural representation of reality. As we grow the scope of requirements, this model should naturally evolve. So I'm going to add a new requirement, which was not in the problem statement. So suppose we want to support something like interlibrary loans. So the normal situation with a library is a patron a person goes to the library and borrows books and other materials and interacts with the library. Where interlibrary loan is where libraries lend to each other. Uh, a patron may want a library item which is not at his or her local library, so the library can reach out to another library and still serve the need of the patron. So let's add a new class for interlibrary loan. We can't handle this class with the same mechanism as for library patron because they're much different. So we call it inter. If we uh, try to handle it with the same um, infrastructure as we have for patrons, we're force fitting the model. That's not mat natural. We're not going to do a good job of servicing requirements. So let's add a few fields for interlibrary loan. We're going to have a uh, checkout date. We're going to have a due date. And we're going to have a return date. The day it's actually returned may not be when it's due. It might be before or after. Oh, let's make a little more room. So the interlibrary loan, well, it's going to have a um, originating library. And it's going to have the borrower library. So, um, so let's just call it like source and target. Source library is a library that provides a book. And the target library is the library that uh, requested the book. Maybe these aren't the best names. But we're going to clarify these as we go. Once again, when I'm interacting with an audience, I try to use names they suggest. If, oops, not right. If they... Uh, and if they don't suggest names, well, I put names up there. If it's a halfway reasonable name, they'll often accept it. If it's not a good name, they'll react to it. And then, of course, we fix it. So that's one way to get people to volunteer information. You put something up, they don't like it. Well, then you fix it. So it's got one source and one target. And then, of course, a library can participate many times in both capacities. Okay, so that's an interlibrary loan. Uh, and then, of course, it's got to refer to a specific copy of a library item. And that's the uh, that's what's the subject. That's the subject of the loan, of course. Let's put that. So it refers to one copy. And the copy can be loaned many, many, multiple times over time. Okay, so that's our first attempt at it, but that's not the best. 
So um, let's call this target. Let's rename that to borrower. Change the name. So I change that to borrower. That's a little better name. Okay, so the borrower, but the source of the book is the same as the owner of the book. So there's some redundancy between here and here. If we have an interlibrary note loan, we know what copy it is. If we have the copy, then we know who the owning library is. So therefore, there's no need for a source. And you don't want to add redundancy to a model like this. It makes it bigger. It causes confusion. It's, uh, it can potentially, it's, it's, it's data that can get out of sync. So it serves no purpose. You only add redundancy to a model very sparingly. If it's if you got important performance issues, you might add it occasionally if you're talking to an audience and it's an important concept that they want to visually see. So we can delete this one. We'll get rid of this source relationship because we picked it up with the borrower. I mean, we picked it up with this. And let's clarify it. This is really the owner. Let's rename it to owner. Before it didn't have a role because it was the only one. It didn't seem significant. But now the fact that we have a borrower and we're referencing it with an interlibrary loan, it's not a bad idea to try to clarify what that is. So so another another thing you won't see here in this demo, but which I do in practice. So I do when I construct these kinds of models for my clients, you have to document the model. And I use two different approaches to document the model. One approach is... Oh, if I'm dealing with a very sophisticated technical audience, I'll do like a data dictionary. And in a modeling tool like this, you can click on an item. Here I clicked on the class. And you can see here, you can type in, type in information on the class there. And so you can do similarly with the attributes and operations. So that's called a data dictionary. I only do that for a very sophisticated technical audience. For a business audience or people who are less comfortable with modeling, what I routinely do is I'll create like a Microsoft Word document, copy and paste modeling diagrams into the document, and then write up explanation of the of the model as I go. That means you got two things to keep in sync. You got to keep the source model in sync and this document in sync. But generally, you don't go through that heavy of revisions, and it's not a large document. And the advantage of doing it that way is it's very friendly for the business people. It's, you know, you got pros. It's written that documents this and explains it and they helps them get their arms around it because you go through a modeling exercise with a lot of busy people for an application that a business is spending money to build. That's a major investment and it's worth documenting properly. So you can see here we naturally extended the model. So let me talk about another advanced aspect I really haven't talk, talked about so far, and that's the issue of patterns. Now, this model doesn't lend itself to patterns that well, but there's still some patterns in the model. So one pattern is the notion of item description to item. And in my one book, I give an example of like uh, a published flight to an actual flight. The published flight is a thing that the airline puts on the website they'll sell you, and the actual flight is that published flight on a specific date because they keep data for each of those flights and specific dates also. So item type in one sense is description with regard to library item. That's a pattern. And similarly, library item is description with respect to library item copy. So when you talk about the Grapes of Wrath and the title level, that's description with respect to the physical copy of the book. And is it stained or is it torn or exactly what date was a copy purchased? Things like that. So you can see here this distinction between those planes is quite important because earlier in the model we had checkout item uh, associated with library item, which was wrong, and we had to correct it to library item copy. So in the model, if you do not clearly distinguish these kinds of planes, uh, you're prone to errors and mistakes, deep errors and mistakes, and you really don't want to do it. That's nasty bugs. So another example of patterns in this model is the notion of archetypes. And a common archetype is the idea of an order. An order, an order, like a order entry system. You have orders and order items. And checkout is very analogous to that. We have checkout and checkout item. And that's one of the reasons I modeled it like that. 
a couple parts ago is I was trying to stay consistent with that pattern in my mind for orders. So at this point I'm done with the presentation of the model. Let me just give you a very brief advertisement. If you've enjoyed this presentation, if you think it could be helpful to your business, I'm a consultant. Please contact me. You can get more information about my books, training, and consulting at my website, www.modelsoftcore.com, M-O-D-E-L-S-O-F-T-E-C-O-R-P.com. And that was on part one. There was a title page with that information. So thank you for um, listening in. Also, if you got email, feel free to send me an email. And if you have a comment, positive or negative, I'd like to hear that. If you've got questions, I'll try to respond. My email is blaha, B-L-A-H-A, at computer.org. Thank you.